Well, good evening and welcome to each of you tonight. To begin, we're just going to sing a verse of number 79 and invite you to stand while we sing and then we'll have prayer and then we'll get on with the uh, various musical instruments. Number 79, verse 1. Thou didst leave thy throne in thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home there was found no room for thy holy nativity. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart. Say a prayer at this time. I'd like to ask Brother Rob Miller if he'll lead us in prayer, please. Father, thank you for this time and place that we have to come. We pray that Christ would be glorified tonight through the playing of the special music, which is written in honor of his coming to earth to die for our sins. We ask for your leadership tonight. We pray a special blessing and your mercies to be extended unto your people who are dealing with matters beyond their control tonight. Guide us through these days in which we're living, especially this time of the year. May we truly represent this time of the year for what it, it is all about. And it certainly it's not the commercial things that our world primarily focuses on, but it is on the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we want to say we appreciate each of you here tonight. And I don't have an... Uh, order of the sequence of things that are going to happen. I might say we did have the piano tuned, so it is up on its maintenance, and so it probably won't smoke or anything, but it'll probably endure. But we have quite a few tonight. We have some that are sick and not able to be here, but we appreciate all that have put into some extra time for this event. So I'm going to sit down, and from here on, we're just going to have people come up who have prepared for this, and you know when you want to come up, when you want to sit down. So uh, I'm going to turn that over to you. All right, we'll get started.
We thank all of you very much. I believe that the Lord has been praised tonight. I don't know whether when that uh, piano was made in Japan, whether they knew it was going to be played by four hands or not. But anyway, very well done. We're going to ask you to stand once more, and we'll sing a verse of 105. 105. got me messed up tonight because the people that sit over here are over here and the people that sit over here are over there so I may be cross-eyed before it's over with but we do welcome you that are visiting with us this is the desire to bring glory and honor to God through the way that God prescribes in his word and one of those ways is through musical instruments <clears throat> and so we're going to touch a little bit on that tonight and uh, this is a Wednesday night service, and I remind you, Wednesday night is not over till midnight. So, uh, no. Anyway, I'm not going to keep you that long. But I feel there are a lot of things important at this season. We know the story. We know how that Christ was born of a virgin in Bethlehem, the divine incarnation. And I felt led to bring us some thoughts about how we praise the Lord and what God would want us to do in offering our praise to him. So I'm going to try to cut it as short as I can without uh, cutting out any meat from the subject, but in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, God says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. That, I believe, is the point that we want to make tonight. What we offer to God is to be made acceptable to him. And it isn't a question of how it would appear to us, but any time that you're offering something to somebody, to honor them, to show your affection and respect, the effort is to offer what you know will please them and not necessarily what pleases you. And sometimes when it comes to gift giving, you find that out pretty quick because you may have bought something and you thought, boy, this is great. And the person that you give it to, they have to force a smile because it's just not exactly what they wanted. So when it comes to the offering of sacrifice of praise unto the Lord, first of all, we have to realize there is a sacrifice involved in that. And when you think about a sacrifice, it means that we are giving up something of ourself to please the one that we're offering it unto. And that is so important to follow the lead of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, not my will, thine be done. So that's a very important thing when it comes to offering a sacrifice unto the Lord. God tells us in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8 and 9 
Our thoughts are not God's thoughts, and our ways are not God's ways. <clears throat> so when it comes to pleasing God, we must have no expediency that goes beyond God's word, and we must not have any convenience that fails to meet the standards of God's word. Everything must be determined by what we see in the Bible. God says that in Hebrews 11:6, that without faith, it is impossible to please him. And faith is that which comes by hearing the word of God. So this may be a little different perhaps than perhaps the way we might think about things in general, but we have to get it back to the fact it's got to be a sacrifice acceptable to God in order for it to be received of the Lord. You have many examples in the Bible of people that tried their own ways. We know that Cain tried his way. He did not offer the sacrifice that God called for, and God didn't accept his sacrifice. Leviticus chapter 10, you have two of God's priests that offered strange fire. And that is, this was something that appealed enthusiastic and inspirational to them, but it was not according to God's word. And God sent fire down from heaven and devoured them. So that was a very dangerous move upon their part. So there are many that we could go to tonight, but I want to read over in Matthew chapter 7, and I think these are truths that all of us definitely need to be sure about because uh, what may be acceptable to us and approved of by us may not at all uh, rank with God. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So it's not just about having a religious devotion or some biblical story to garnish what we're doing. It's not about just having some high moral standards, cast out devils. It's not just about doing many charitable works, like it mentions here, done, done many wonderful works. But what it is about is doing the will of God doing the will of God. Somebody says, well, what about sincerity? Sincerity doesn't count. You can be sincerely wrong. And so that's why God says doing his will. And of course, the, the real problem with this is this many that Christ referred to here didn't really get this straight in their minds until it was too late. And that is, he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. And you know, that's not where we want to wind up. We don't want to wind up standing before God, having done a lot here on earth in the name of Christ, and what we thought was a good thing to do, and then Christ say, I never knew you. I never knew you, because it wasn't according to the will of God. So... This is something that we should want our efforts to be approved of at the judgment seat of Christ because they have been about proving God's will here on this earth. And, of course, the idea, well, preacher, that's not the way I see it. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says our, uh, that we walk by faith, not by sight. So I want to reference a few scriptures in the book of Psalms quickly. In Psalm chapter 107, and the book of Psalms has many, many praise psalms written. And in verse 21 and 22 of Psalm 107, it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing when it comes to the wonderful works of God we cannot improve upon them we cannot 
you might say, make them to be more glorious in what they are because we only see them in part and God's works are more wonderful than we can describe. It's a shame that a lot of people can't see that. Um, <clears throat> you know, we know that the Bible says we all sin and fall short of God's glory and sometimes people don't have a God big enough to even serve. They don't have a God big enough to even worship or honor him. Going over to Psalm chapter 150. In Psalm chapter 150 and there in verse 1. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. One of the best ways we can praise the Lord is to live for him. And let it be a living praise more so than just word of mouth. But we should never lose sight of God's greatness on our behalf. And I might say this, we not only need a savior to redeem our souls in the sight of God, we need a high priest that can keep us in tune with God. And that's where the Lord Jesus Christ is both. He not only savior, he's also our high priest. And he's the one that we can come to him, we can bring all of our weaknesses all of the things that we need and he invites us to bring those to him the devil would like for us to only offer to god something that we think is to our credit but god says he wants to have everything about us brought to him and we should not be ashamed to bring our weaknesses to him that's what he's there for that's what he died for is to help us not to embarrass us if we have a problem, but to help us. So we are to always be mindful of him and not lose sight of his greatness and not feel like that we can only, you know, be uh, with him on a good day, but when we really have a bad day, we really need him to help us then. So that means every day, not just Easter, not just Sunday, not just some special occasion. And certainly if that's where we have relegated our God is just to some holiday, then we are not seeing him for what he really is. To be able to praise God, and I wanna use this as an example of a sacrifice of praise. These people that, pray, that played here tonight, they didn't just get up one morning and play. You know, it took hours it took weeks, it took months, it even took years of personal effort to get to a point where you can offer a sacrifice of praise on a musical instrument. God tells us in Colossians, the third chapter, that whatever we do, we're to do it as unto him and not unto men, but we're to do what we do to the glory of God and for the glory of God. So when a person is saved, we're brought into the kingdom of God by regeneration. And God, Christ said, except a person is born again, they cannot see nor enter the kingdom of God. So that's a good question tonight to throw out to each of you. Have you been born again? You may have church membership. Uh, you may have baptism of some sort. But none of that is the same as being born again. And Christ said, you must be born again. So when we are born again, God says, old things pass away. All things become new. The spirit of God lives within us, constrains us, and leads us. And so the kingdom of God, when we're putting God in his proper place, is the major, not the minor. It's the major. And we should want to prepare ourselves as much as we can to be useful in whatever capacity the Lord can use us. 
So a young man actually should want to prepare themselves to where God could call them to preach. A young lady, to where that God could use them as a pastor's wife, as a deacon's wife, as a Sunday school teacher. We should have that in mind if you're saved because you are born into God's kingdom and you are born to glorify him. So I want to give us just an example in Psalm chapter 1. In Psalm chapter 1, I don't know how you read your Bible. I don't know if you read your Bible. I hope you do. But here in Psalm chapter 1 in verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. There's a lot of things that people can do that are completely out of the realm of honoring God. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. What have you established in your life as far as the word of God is concerned? Well, what this speaks of is that a person has gone to the extent of Bible study that it has become a personal delight to them. Not just an obligation, not just something that they would smite their conscience with if they don't do it, but <clears throat> like a plant that is by a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in due season. God sees us. You know, I don't have to, to, uh, to check out what people do. I know there's a rumor going around town, and I guess it's just one of many. But the rumor is, if you come to Faith Baptist Church, you've got to show me your W-2 statement so I can tell you how much you've got to give to the church. That's out there. It's a rumor out there. So there's a whole lot of rumors out there, but when it comes to what we do for the Lord, it's about what God sees, what God sees. And so do, does God see you have an interest in his word? Now, it's, it's a yes or no. I mean, it's not that complicated. Um, we all have interest in TV shows. We have interest in sports. Where does God's word rank along with those? Well, you know, we're going to have to give an answer to God for that. And wouldn't it be sad if God was to say, well, you were on earth, you spent so many hours a week on your cell phone, and you spent so many hours a week watching television, and you spent so many hours going here and doing that, but you did not read my word. You know, we're going to face that. Why not do it now? Why not face it now? So we need to study God's word to, for God to really see that person has an interest in me. That person has an interest in my will. That person has an interest in the things that are important. And then, of course, we need to study God's word for our knowledge, to meditate on what we read, because God will quicken the right thoughts in our minds as we do that. Somebody said, well, I don't understand the Bible. Probably because you don't read it. Now, I understand that a person cannot, <clears throat> before they're saved, really understand spiritual things. But let me give you this little tip. God says his word is light. So when you read something and you have read it, and you haven't just passed the time with it, but you've read it, you may not th thoroughly understand what's there. But if you have read it, and somebody else comes along and tells you something contrary to that, you know, this is what the Bible says. God's word is light. It shines in our dark place. It reveals what is. So when we study the Bible, we're going to get enough knowledge that eventually this will build up and we'll know. This is right. This is not right. This is for God. This is not for God. But that won't happen 
unless we personally study the Word of God. So establish your own personal communication with the mind of God through your meditation in His Word. You say, well, I like to read uh, these little devotional books. That's fine, but add that on top of your own personal Bible study. Because you may find in reading, and I've, uh, I found that sometimes you read after somebody else, you're reading their thoughts, not God's. So make sure you know God's word first. God says that we are to prepare our hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. So we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God. Our calling and our election is about always making ourselves available and preparing ourselves to be used to the Lord. And as far as the sacrifices, you know, you don't give up anything to serve God. You receive. And whatever you give back to God, he's going to give it back to you multiplied in this life as well as in heaven, having a reward for it. Paul said this about the sacrifices because Sometimes people say, well, I'll have to give this up and I can't do this. Well, Philippians 3, 8, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but dung that I may win Christ. What is the value of it beyond this life? Something that you may think I have to sacrifice in order if I were to do the will of God. What's going to be the value of that beyond this life? And then I want to leave you with one of the most important questions that Christ asked his, his disciples. Lovest thou me more than these? Lovest thou me more than these? May we bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, we're thankful tonight that you have talented, that you have blessed the efforts of people, that you have given them a desire to do that, which would be for the praise and honor of our Lord. And we know that Jesus Christ left all of his glory and his comfort and his pleasure and his praise. He left all that behind when he left heaven to come to this earth and when it came, the first move that was made toward him was to have him killed by King Herod. And as the scripture says, he is despised and rejected of men. And so we know that as you look about Christ and as we see his sacrifices that he made personally and about how that he did not amass anything for himself here on earth, but he came to do the will of the Father we know that his glory, because of that, is far beyond anything that we could possibly describe tonight. And I pray that you'll help us to want to see things spiritually rather than physically and personally and circumstantially because all these are going to pass away and only what's done for you is going to last. And first of all, it begins with a person recognizing they're a sinner recognizing that they themselves are guilty before God and recognizing the need to have a complete change of mind about themselves and turn from what they are and turn to you with all of their heart, seeking you to save them and to make them your child. And the message is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved because he has made the provision for our salvation both in meeting the penalty for our sin, which is to shed his blood, and also meeting the demand of God's righteousness and that he kept all of your will perfectly. And we're thankful for him. And we are reminded again at this season of that great gift that you gave in giving your son to be our savior. And we pray that we'll want to honor him. If there's anyone here tonight that you're speaking to, as we sing the song, How Great Thou Art, I pray, Father, that there would be a desire and a willingness to respond to you because of who you are. So bless this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand as we sing number 22.